let's just start with with introductions um, for the benefit as well of, of those who may be watching this on demand. Um, let's just start with also just just a brief introduction of yourself, Abby, just again, in case people are solely watching the panel. Abby. <laughs> Hi, I'm Abigail Dean and I'm Head of Strategic Insights for Nuveen Real Estate. We're a global real estate asset manager. Super, thanks very much. Um, Michel. Thank you, Richard. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Michel van Oostroom. I'm Director of Investments at Hartel Fund Management. Uh, we manage the Apollo Healthcare Property Fund. Uh, the fund invests in senior housing and healthcare facilities in the Netherlands. And we currently have a portfolio of approximately 160 million spread over uh, different sectors in the Dutch healthcare market. And the fund provides for institutional investors a combination of a stable financial return and a sustainable impact return. Great, thank you. Martin. Thank you, Richard. Um, hi, my name is Martin Strachkov. I'm the head of impact and head of residential and impact investment at LaSalle Investment Management. We are a global investment management firm with my responsibilities effectively covering all investments that have a bed in them. <laughs> Great, thank you. Nella. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Nella Kreer, the head of sustainability and CSR at BNP Paribas Real Estate Investment Management. We are a European investment manager investing uh, uh, in around 17 countries and managing 30 billion of uh, assets. And my role is definitely to define and implement a specific ESG strategy for our investors. Great, thanks very much, Nella. Um, Ron. Good morning, my name is uh, Ron van Lois. I'm senior lecturer at the Amsterdam School of Real Estate since 2012, both on Master of Real Estate uh, Resources and also on the executive education. And uh, beginning of 2020, we founded the Senior Housing and Healthcare Association. And I'm proud to be the chairman of this uh, multi-stakeholder and pan-European platform. And next to these activities, I'm also having my own advisory firm called Multiple Impact, uh, totally focused on alternative real assets and investments. Great. Thanks very much, Ron. Um, Martin, let's let's just start with you, and I'm going to pick up some of the points um, that, that Abby had in the presentation there, really lots of great detail. Um, and of course, if you've got questions or comments, do please make them. Um, you can use the Q&A or the chat buttons. I'll be monitoring those. Um, and uh, that's one of the joys of being live is that we can answer your questions. So if you've got any questions, do please ask them. Um, Martin, just, just coming to you. Um, I mean, there's been a growing focus um, throughout the pandemic um, on ESG more broadly. Um, how do you see this influencing investor demand, particularly for, for sort of responsible investment and impact strategies? Uh, yeah, excellent question. Thank you, Richard. And uh, now let me just start by like, uh, saying, Abby, uh, that, that was a fantastic presentation. Thank you very much for that. I think it's, um, it's fair to say that ESG and responsible investment has shot up at the, uh, at the forefront of investors' considerations. Um, I've been saying for a while that every investor is an impact investor. It's just some of, some of them don't know what the impact is. And what the difference with the impact investing is you actually, as, as Abby very eloquently said, you, are, you measure and you manage the impact of your investments. And I think that's really um, what has heightened the investors demand during the pandemic is just realizing how exactly are we are we contributing to a problem or are we contributing to a solution and being able to contribute to a solution without sacrificing risk adjusted returns is really what has uh, driven the increase in impact investment and esg strategies um and uh, from from your point of view ron um just just you know when when we're looking at, at, at impact um, there's, a, there's a lot of different meanings for that. Um, so I suppose, how do you quantify that for, for your business? Yeah, well, I, I also totally agree on the, on the keynote of Abigail. Uh, I think in general, investors are searching for volume, size and yield. But uh, I think more and more we see investors are focused on the global trends and also the shifts. Because I think, for example, scarcity of uh, resources uh, health and well-being, but also the aging uh, uh, demographics 
are a very important trends where investors try to align their strategy on. And uh, therefore also uh, real estate investors are more and more focused on investing in senior housing, healthcare real estate, educational facilities, uh, but also, uh, for example, uh, the life sciences. And I think um, it's, it's indeed, uh, it's going from matching on, on Paris proof uh, agreement, but also more and more on the social element. And I think one of the, the biggest uh, challenges is to measure the impact and also to try to create a value chain between the user, the investor, and also the, the SDGs where we try to align on. And I think this is also where we have to uh, cooperate more closely in, in the value chain of real estate. Okay, good. Um, and uh, Nella, feel free to pick up any points that you want. And indeed, all of the speakers, if you've got any points, do just jump in. <laughs> um, but but Nella, I mean, what do you see as driving this? I mean, I think there's kind of broad agreement that, that there's been accelerated a bit by um, the pandemic. Um, but are you seeing it driven more by regulation, more by um, demand from capital? Um, what, what's your sense of what's driving this trend? Right. So I think all of that uh, in the past, investors have been looking for performance, obviously, and it's still the case. But today, what we can see is that they are looking for a uh, performance with purpose and definitely with, with impact. It's a differentiating factor and uh, it's a kind of triptych regulation, investor demand, and obviously the convictions uh, of the market. And that's what's our role as an investment manager to push and combine all these elements together to uh, develop much more uh, ESG driven products. Uh, impact investing funds and uh, we will be challenged on our ability to deliver still the performance this is why we are paid for and deliver what is the impact we are definitely uh, uh, delivering uh, uh, with that um, and one of the one of the things that's that's been talked about you know, in terms of ESG over the past while is that actually this is just more marketing speak. We're not actually really doing anything um, that this is about ticking boxes, not about the industry changing. Um, Michelle, do, do you think that this is now a sign that the industry is changing this sort of focus, not just on ESG, but also impact as well? Yeah, I believe, Richard, that uh, the industry is really changing. Uh, what we see is that uh, investors in our fund, for example, really focus on the combination of financial return and, imp and social impact return. And I believe, especially with real assets, that's also really possible to achieve that. Uh, and um, one of the big changes the last years that it's also possible to measure the social impact. I think that that's really driving now the, the flow of capital to impact investments. So from your point of view, the measurement is a really key element of that. Yeah, I think that's 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 a key, key element. And it's also, uh, to be honest, a challenge. Uh, we, mm. it's, it's possible to, to establish a framework uh, for which groups you want to uh, to achieve uh, the social impact, and it's also possible to uh, define the indicators uh, which you measure on. But really, measuring that's that's still challenging. As, uh, for example, with affordable affordable housing, it's possible. But if you go to indicators which we do like satisfaction, it's it's more complex, and and also complex to to compare it with your competitors. Okay, and and Martin, do you do you see this? I mean, I suppose how do you see this measurement of of ES and G, um, particularly in in that sense? How much of a challenge is is I suppose measurement, and is this a kind of evolving situation where it's gradually improving over time? What what's the position there? Um, yeah, absolutely. I think um, what to kind of if we look back, probably about five to seven to ten years measuring the E was hard and now measuring the E is easy. Well, it's much easier. It's not necessarily easy. You still have a number of tenants who are saying, um, I just signed a 20 year um, for repairing and insuring, please. Why would I give you that information? Just 
kind of get out of my sight, you know, like almost wanting that absentee landlord. However, we are seeing that a lot of the investment managers, and I'm sure Mel and Abby and, and, and Michael would actually be able to say that, to confirm that, is like we actually want to be measuring the E. And I think the next stage is actually measuring the S. And to quote one of my professors from university, whatever gets measured gets managed. In order for us to manage it, we first need to start measuring. And I think um, there is a lot of work, there is a lot of very interesting insights that are being derived from measuring the E. The fact that we know nowadays that 40% of carbon emissions come from the built environment. It's massive. If we are looking to achieve net zero carbon, we have to start with the, co with, with the, with the built environment. And equally, if we want to make a positive societal contribution, we have to start measuring the S and then um, managing these outcomes. Um, and I wanted to pick up with you, um, Abby, just, just that point of intentionality. Um, I, I suppose, how key is that? Is that the real differentiator between what might be an ESG strategy and what is an impact strategy? Yeah, I, th I think it is. And, and I think, you know, you asked about um, how has the industry changed and um, how is this more than than just marketing? And, and I do think that intentionality piece is really important because it stops that E or S piece from just being incidental um, and um, you, you, you just being a, a a positive impact that happens to happen on the side and will maximize it a bit. If you've got intentionality, then then actually the whole strategy has to be built around delivering that. And every investment decision that you make has to return to that um, environmental or social objective. So I, I think the intentionality piece is, is gives a completely different perspective um, than uh, you know, just in, you know, incorporating ESG in. And I think incorporating ESG across mainstream investment is great and positive um, and, and the industry has come a long way doing that. But for those investors that do want to have that extra purpose um, and, and go that extra step, then that's the key with impact investing that it can do. You know, the intentionality piece means that it's a transformative investment um, and that you know, every decision is, is really rooted in delivering that positive impact as well as the return. Um, and, and Nella, just, just coming to you, um, because obviously um, BNP Paribas real estate investment management side, I should get it correct, uh, <laughs> that, uh, that you've been launching um, yeah. an impact, a specific impact fund. So, I mean, maybe just talk us through the, the strategy of that, the decision around that um, and, and, and how that operates and is maybe different to some of the other funds. Absolutely. And, and that's why I wanted to jump in uh, following what uh, Abby was just saying about intentionality. So we have launched a few months ago an impact fund, the first, I would say, a property fund with a, a, an impact strategy aligned with the Paris Agreement. The objective of this fund, which is a European one, a multi-asset class and a core with a core strategy, is to target a reduction of the CO2 emissions of the fund globally by 40% in the next 10 years. So you can tell me that it's just the regulation in some countries, but when you have a, an investment strategy which is European multi-asset class, it becomes challenging. And that's the, the target of this uh, impact fund. And where is the intentionality in that? If you want to illustrate what Abby was saying, we have uh, uh, put specific assumptions in, in, the, in, the, in the business plan of the fund. We have assumed that for each investment, following some uh, estimation, that with uh, around 200 euros per square meter for office building in Europe, we can reach this target of 40% of reduction on the CO2 emissions. In this fund, we do not plan to have heavy refurbishment. We want to upgrade all the existing stock. And that's what Martin was talking about. This is where the challenge is. Upgrading the existing buildings with soft capex, opex, and a strong stakeholder engagement. So that's the plan. The key challenge will be to track that, to measure it, and to demonstrate, obviously, annually to our investors that we are able to deliver that. And this is, I, I think, where the problems will come because it will be uh, difficult to collect data, to reach the objectives, and that's why we believe it's a very challenging uh, um, strategy fund. 
Okay, no, that's interesting. Um, and this is to anybody really, but in terms of the, um, in terms of those challenges of, of um, reporting, measurement, benchmarks, um, I mean, I, I think I, I think it was interesting, Martin, that you said there that that's that's at least there or significantly there in terms of carbon, but not necessarily some of the other sides. How important are our benchmarks moving forward for actually pushing this, you know, pushing the impact side further? I mean, Ron, from from your point of view at the SHHA, I know that that's an area that you're very keen, that sort of benchmarking side so that then we can we can push that forward. So do you see this sort of research element as a, as a critical part? Well, absolutely, because I think uh, when we have data, we can compare also asset classes, we can compare performances. But I also think we need data to uh, make a crossover towards valuation. And I think valuation is the most critical part in terms of measurement, because I totally agree with Nella, I told before, uh, when we have an existing stock and uh, it's outdated, we, we could have a, a valuation before and after. And I think the most important is whether we will invest in existing stock and where, where we can make a, an upside on the, on the valuation side. And, and therefore, in terms of uh, benchmarking uh, both on the ESG uh, uh, elements but also on valuation we need to uh, create this insight whether it's a viable business case um, and indeed whether it's on social on senior housing or healthcare on uh, more housing uh, uh, asset classes I think in general we need this data uh, for uh, the capital providers uh, so I think this is quite a, a crucial element, the valuation side. Um, and Michelle, when I mean, it's, it was interesting, um, Abby's slide there about, um, you know, the, the relative elements of of return, both in terms of the impact return and the financial return. Um, when you're looking at that, um, how do you see that? I mean, do you see it as that there's you know, you're sacrificing in some way um, financial return in order to be able to have the social return, because that's obviously one of the concerns that a lot of people have is, you know, aren't we just simply, you know, sacrificing returns here? Well, I, I believe that it's, that's an outdated thought. Uh, uh, we strongly believe that um, uh, social return drives financial return. And for example, if you look at our uh, business, we are investing in, in healthcare properties in the Netherlands. Uh, if we are able to achieve a higher social return, for example, a high, higher satisfaction rates with our residents or uh, healthcare workers, we strongly believe that that will increase the occupancy of our properties and therefore drive financial return. So we don't see that as uh, pushing down uh, financial return, not at all. And, and Martin, how do, how do you see that? I I completely, completely agree with uh, what Michelle is saying. I think it's, I think that's very much an outdated concept of, of having to sacrifice uh, returns. And, and um, I would argue that over the long period, and there were, uh, there were actually quite a few studies that over the long period, impact style and ESG style strategies actually outperform. So the, the very core nature of impact strategy is that you're targeting a specific problem, which is less transient than a, a commercial fad or fashion. And I think that intransience of the problem, such as what Mello was describing in um, there actually from reduction of the carbon emission, I, that's not going to happen. I mean, even if Nels fund reaches 10 billion, it's still not going to be enough to kind of get us to the carbon neutral position that we want. So we are all invested in the, in the success of these impact strategies. And because of the size and the non-transience of the problems that impact strategies address, over the long term, these are very stable, predictable propositions from an investment standpoint. OK, good. Um, I, I wanted to just pick up a little bit on um, some of the sort of sectors that, that you know, fit naturally with this. And you highlighted them a little bit, um, 
Abby, but let's drill down a bit into that. I mean, uh, how much of this is city transformation? How much of this is looking at specific assets like life sciences, like healthcare? Um, what what naturally sits into in into this area, and that's for anybody really. Well, I don't mind just taking that one to start with, and I, and I think that that's the the wonderful thing about um, this style of investment is that actually it, I do think it suits real estate so well because at its heart real estate exists to provide buildings that are of use to people so you know it's a, it, you know, if, and if your buildings are not useful to people then not only they're not going to deliver a positive social impact they're also not going to um, deliver the financial return that's necessary over the long term um, there's some really clearly obvious sectors that you would start with the, the, the most obvious for impacts investing such as affordable housing um such as provision of health care um education i think also um you know as nella has highlighted a, you know a strategy specifically looking at transforming buildings to be net zero carbon um but actually investing in a responsible way in any um, real estate strategy that provides a benefit to a community, whether that be social and environmental, um, can be an impact investment um, as long as it's you know, set out with that clear, what is the intention, what is the benefit, um, positive impact that you're trying to achieve, um, how is that being delivered and how is it being measured. Um, so that, that's why real estate and other real assets suit the impact investing style so well, because you know, a, a building at its heart has to deliver a socially useful purpose or it's not going to have a future. Um, and Michelle, just talk us through in terms of, of, of your sector. Uh, what do you mean, Richard? Uh, are we... I, I mean, in, in terms of, I mean, how, how are your investors seeing that? So, you know, how are they seeing this impact element of it in, in terms of the overall, you know, view on, on your business, really? Yeah, what, what we started out the fund uh, a couple of years ago uh, and uh, 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 we attracted some uh, investors who were looking for the combination of a financial and a social uh, impact return and uh, we set up an investment process where both were included and now each and every uh, asset we are looking at uh, of investing is, is going through that process and uh, also in the investment decision process uh, the intentions of the social impact are included so we monitor that uh, after acquisition if they are achieved and if they are not achieved how we can simulate uh, those indicators uh, by extra measurements to achieve them uh, afterwards. OK, good. Um, and, and Martin, I, I just wanted to pick up with you. Um, I mean, in in terms of these, the, the sector side of it, um, I mean, you're focused as well on the residential side there as as uh, as part of your responsibility at LaSalle. Um, so, I mean, Abby already mentioned there the affordable housing side of that. Um, so, how does that work with with your strategy and how you, how do you deal with with issues like Abby mentioned there, which is about how do you ensure what's going to happen with those, those assets next and those kinds of things that they're not sold on to somebody else? You know, how, how much of that is necessary within this strategy? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that's a, that's an excellent question. I think the, the, the comment that Abby made about impactful exits is a very, very important one. Um, it is um, in, the way that we have defined impact investments within La Salle is a focus on homes, health, and learning. Um, and it, it, I, I was very pleased to see that that, that that Abby have actually kind of come up with effectively the same the same three critical uh, real estate subsectors because we firmly believe that real estate is the ultimate impact asset class. It's a store of value. It provides safety and shelter for people. It's 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 the place where where, where people uh, effectively uh, thrive and learn. So as such, I, if you want to invest in from a real asset perspective, real estate is the ultimate impact asset class by all means. I think um, we are very much focused on measuring the uh, 
who are intentionally going into the investments and then also measuring the impact of this investment. I think, um, and then equally that impactful exit is, is, is a critical piece for us. We don't want to make, we don't want to provide affordable housing, back to the example, back to the example that we've been discussing this morning. We don't want to provide affordable housing for a limited number of years, effectively get on a planning gain policy that we can flip on um, in three to five years. For us, impact investing is a long-term proposition and it's a long-term income-driven uh, risk-adjusted returns. And in order to achieve that, we need to be mindful of the impactful exit as well. Which can fit to any asset class, I believe. I mean, as long as you define a specific objective of impact investing, it can fit to office, residential, healthcare, whatever. So we, we should not limit, I think, the impact investing area. Uh, on the opposite, we have to, to broaden it, absolutely. Well, that's Maybe an interesting it. point, Nella. And, and in... in in that sense, how do we broaden it beyond those? I mean, I can see the ones that have a, you know, have a positive impact. Um, but how would you define things? You know, I mean, if you're in logistics or in, you know, I can see it for infrastructure, for example. Um, how do we broaden it? I mean, does it mean that all assets are, are potentially available to this kind of, uh, of, of approach? I strongly believe that, yes. By asset class, there are specific ESG angles that could be pushed and that could be strengthened. For residential, it can be something for logistics, anything or something else. So that's why we have to screen and, and try to fit that to the different investment strategy of our, of our portfolio and propose it to our investors. So, uh, yes, I think so. Yeah, I, I also believe that. I think uh, that uh, what we are looking at at healthcare, but I think you can borrow that on all sectors, is we are looking at to achieve an impact for uh, for residents, for people working in our buildings and for the neighborhood. So I believe you can also do that for officers, for retail, logistics, any kind of real asset. Yeah, I, I really agree with that as well. I mean, I think if you if you look at, for example, setting aside a proportion of a building for a, a more affordable rents for tenants who are providing social value, if you look at um, job creation and particularly good job creation, so um, those earning a, a living wage, um, if, if both indirectly through tenants, but also directly um, if people employed in the building that, you know, to clean or security or, or that kind of thing. Um, for logistics, if you're looking at investing in the infrastructure around um, green vehicle charging and renewable energy, you know, there's you can see with with each asset class, there are um, some you know, clear areas that you can focus on to have a positive environmental and social impact within that asset class. Um, so I completely agree with, with Nella that there, you know, this works across all real estate asset classes. Um, it's just about identifying what are the specific positive impacts you want to have within each of those and how can they be delivered um, so um, do, do we see this as a as a way that in fact real estate can can kind of help lead this transformation yeah maybe richard one additional remark also from a research perspective because i think we see a shift from nice to have to must have and I think in general, uh, when you look from an investor perspective, it's also a bit of the ball game of correlation. So which asset class correlates to each other? And I think investors are more and more searching for asset classes with a low correlation on the economic cycles. And therefore, you see a shift towards senior housing, uh, long-term nursing homes, when we speak about healthcare, real estate, uh, the educational facilities, so both the core real estate, but also student housing. And I think life sciences uh, also may be driven by uh, the COVID pandemic. Uh, uh, so we are searching for resilient asset classes, but also from a investor perspective, where is the correlation? So when we have an investment portfolio, uh, do, are we future proof? And I think this is also what drives sometimes the strategy of uh, yeah, well, investors to uh, focus on uh, different asset classes. No, I, I think completely that's... agree with that. Uh, sorry, sorry, Richard, like, with, with what Ron was saying. I think 
I, if you are a core slash core plus investor in any asset class across the real estate, you can set up as Nella and Abby and, and help impact specific targets for each subsector. And effectively, my strong view is that if you are a long-term buy and hold investor in real estate, you have to be targeting positive impact. Because that's effectively what means, that's effectively what delivers the resilience of the income and the resilience of the real estate. Yes, if, if we go back a few years uh, a few years ago, environmental certification were not mainstream. Today, it's kind of mainstream. So I think impact investing will become mainstream in the future because it's the only key uh, and only solution to, uh, especially on the E part, environmental part, to achieve the global objective. I remind you that the global objective is to limit the global warming. So it's essential to work on social and governance topics, but we have to limit the global temperature. So we have to work on the existing stock. So all the, the, the uh, what we call today an impact investing strategy will become obviously a mainstream strategy in a few years, and it has to. But now uh, maybe also a bit critical remark because uh, I think in the last five years uh, we see on the environmental side that you, that occupiers are able to pay more rent when we have outperformance on Brium, for example. Uh, mm -hmm. And of course, that's also uh, related to the valuation of real estate. So yes. when you have higher rental levels or when you have a lower occupancy grade, uh, the, 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 the valuation of an asset is, is more higher. But I think the social side is still still difficult. That also was one of the, the remarks of Michel. Uh, it's still difficult when you have a social impact where is the outcome of your investment? So when we have uh, maybe a, a better a living environment for people with dementia, you should see it on the rental level of your occupancy, or you can see it on the, on the yield side. And I think this is still a critical element because valuation of the S is still, mm. it's, it's not common. So uh, that's also my question to you. What's your perspective on the valuation side? Because I'm not really positive on the S and the valuation. Yes, no, I, I, I tend to agree. But uh, if I can be more critical, I don't believe that the, the environmental part is correctly and properly uh, assessed in the valuation and all the valuation. For a very simple reason, it's because 90% of the stock is not certified and not really compliant with a high efficient uh, area. So uh, it's not in our interest or in anyone's interest to, to decrease the value of that. But I agree also that the, the challenge will be to much more uh, integrate the social party in the valuation. But let's be careful. It's difficult to address all the topics at the same time anyway. Yeah, if I may add, I think, I think it's actually a very interesting uh, discussion and uh, actually I'm really enjoying it. I think the S part is a, a, you have to look at it from different perspectives. If, I, if I'm a developer, I obviously have very little long-term hold or incentives to create anything. However, if I'm a long-term buy and hold investor representing a pension fund, I have all the incentives to create, as, as Abby rightfully pointed out, a sustainable a living environment is actually uh, opening and welcoming to all. I mean, the King's Cross regeneration in London is a prime example. It's a long-term vision. The South Bank regeneration, or Stratford regeneration, these are long-term visions. So you just need that long-term investor to start driving the change in behavior in the development side or in the, in the, in the medium, the short to medium-term investors. And I think that's what we are seeing, or at least that's what we are seeing at LaSalle, is that it's the long-term asset holders that are saying, hold on, you cannot just assume that this asset is going to flip in five years' time, and the fact that you haven't done any of the S, or, well, it started really with the E, as Nestel said, and it's actually, it is feeding through. I, I've seen situations where effectively assets become completely unsellable within a short period of time because of the E side of things. Completely unsellable. You go from yeah, I, 20 investors to zero investors, potential buyers. 
Yeah, I, I feel like so five to ten years ago, there was a, a feeling that surely it's obvious that improving the environmental performance of buildings would add to their value, but it was very hard to, to find any evidence of that. So you had a long period of saying, well, it's obvious that you improve the environmental performance of a building, you reduce the running cost, you make it a better quality building, it should add value. But we were struggling to get there. I don't think we've completely solved that yet. I would agree with, with, with Nella, but but I think that we are really on the cusp of that now. And, and it is it's not it's not a controversial thing to say that buildings that are um, you know, more energy efficient, that are certified, are going to hold their value better or that buildings that are you know, really inefficient are at, at great risk of obsolescence. I think that's a that's a very you know, accepted mainstream view. I think we're in the same place now with the social where you feel well just of course it's obvious that a building that is meeting the social needs of the local community is going to hold its value better and is going to you know be a you know, is not going to at risk of, of becoming an elephant and not being uh, you know not you know, become, you know using its losing its purpose so I think that there's an obvious thing there but it's really hard there, the data doesn't exist what do you actually monitor how do you correlate that with value um, we're definitely still at the point where we're just starting to gather that information and hopefully those proof points will start to emerge but as a as a long you know as a long-term investor I think can make that conviction call and say well we believe that by um, investing responsibly and by focusing on the social value that will protect the value, the value of our buildings we don't necessarily need to see all the proof yet it feels like the right kind of call and and we believe that that data will start to emerge in the next few years. Um, interesting. I, I, I got a question from uh, Martin Zanocchi here. Um, thanks very much for joining us, Martin. Um, which is, is there any issue for the major decision makers um, or a question of how to make investments, um, I suppose, with, with good intentions? Um, so is this something, I guess, that, uh, I mean, probably more, um, more for, for Abby Nella and uh, and Martin. I mean, outside of the impact um, funds or the or the strategies, um, are people looking at these now assets? I mean, is it beginning to feed more into asset selection more generally, even if it's not a specific impact fund? You know, um, in terms of the acquisition process, are people beginning to run that through more more widely than than just for if it's an impact strategy? It is. I think it is. I can. Uh, I can uh, give the example of what we do at BNP Paribas. Uh, all new investments are screened through an ESG assessment, just at least to have a photography of the potential ESG risk of the building. It is a necessity, as uh, a few years ago it was about the pollution or uh, or uh, the, the the area of where the building is. So it's becoming mandatory. Um, uh, plus. Uh, we, we should not forget that some climate risk and uh, physical and most specifically transition risks have to be assessed and identified to make sure that what we are buying today is not going to be obsolete in five to ten years due to some specific climate uh, uh, impact. So it is becoming more and more uh, asked from our investors and it's our responsibility of investment manager to push and propose that and be more selective at, uh, at acquisition, definitely. Okay, good. Um, and Martin, if that didn't answer your question, um, send it send it to me again just to let me know. <laughs> but, but I hope it did. Um, I wanted to pick up a little bit um, uh, just because there's sort of 15 minutes left now. So again, if you've got any questions, um, now's the time. Um, I just wanted to dig into the part, Abby, where, where you said about uh, I suppose how it might influence different areas and particularly the exit strategy, but also the asset management strategy. I mean, so do we now have to think far more about, you know, areas like tenant selection, um, supplier selection? Um, you know, is this is this something that we have to live as an investor um, and look at all of those those, those areas? Um, you know, does it does it matter, for example, what your tenant is doing in your building? Yeah, I, I think it does require a much more active asset management role. This type of investment, you you know, you you do have to be a much more involved um, landlord and steward of the building. So, 
Um, yes, it, it, it you know, certainly for a specific impact strategy, tenant selection is key. Um, <clears throat> And there are certain you know, types of tenants that you'd probably or certainly would screen out um, and, uh, and and but more positively working with tenants to deliver positive environmental and social impact will be at, at the heart um, of, of you know of a successful impact strategy so um, I think it it is about it's not just about you know what, what kind of buildings you buy it's about how you manage those buildings what you do with those buildings and continually coming back to that as well particularly with this you know long-term um, perspective about you know, looking at well, what is the right long-term investment strategy for this asset um, how do we adapt it um, to make sure that it's it's meeting both from an environmental and social perspective the, the the needs of the area it's in and how do we engage with both the tenants and the local community to take that on board so it, it does require a more active approach um, than maybe has been standard to date and will that mean an adjustment? I mean, Martin, when you're when you're you know, when you're talking to the asset management side, for example, does that mean a real adjustment in their way of thinking? Um, it does. Actually, it does. It means that effectively almost every type of real estate becomes operational real estate. So you have to understand your tenants. You have to understand what drives them. You have to understand how they make decisions. So I think that's that's. For me, that's kind of the real change in terms of the asset management thinking, and, and, and it, it's um, it's it's interesting because um, in the operational real estate, for example, in residential, that's that's been the bread and butter of how residential has been operated. But I think some of the other asset classes um, are kind of very quickly kind of coming to that realization that I you can say that yes, I have a I have a a shopping center that's you know it's generating the seven percent yield and that's fantastic until it's not and then and then and then you kind of have to have to get into the operational more effectively like who's gonna step into that, that that into the shoes how do you actually change it how do you reposition it very very quickly so being on the operate being on the operational side is for me it's a, it's a it's a really exciting place to be in order to drive change and both on the environmental the social and the governance side Okay, good. Um, and I just wanted to to, to pick up in, in terms of, um, I guess, the main strategies to deliver the, the social benefits and financial returns. Um, what are you, um, I suppose, Abby, what, what are you actively doing in terms of um, the business there in order to be able to, to do that? And, um, and I, I suppose, how much preparation is there in the, the strategy and then the delivery of that strategy? Um, I, mean, I think we, we look at both the environmental and the social. So um, you know, what we're doing on the environmental side is ensuring that we have a business plan in place for every individual asset um, to achieve a specified reduction in energy and in carbon emissions and to achieve net zero carbon by a specified date. So it's about you know, setting up that you know, typically will be you know, five to 10 year plan to get the building to that point and what that looks like in terms of when you can get in, make the necessary upgrades, the ongoing improvements that you can make um, and you know, that being at the heart of the plan for that building. Um, on the on the social side, um, I think on, on the environmental, there, there is almost a a sort of a clear pathway of how to do that. Uh, yes, it varies building to building, but there are, you know, you know the things that you need to do to a building. Uh, you have to make it more energy efficient. You have to improve the glazing in some instances, get rid of the gas. You have to put um, renewable energy on it. There is a, a, you know, a route map there. On the social, as we've all been discussing, it varies so significantly um, from asset to asset. So um, it's a, you know, and it depends on the strategy of the, you know, of, of the, the fund that it sits within so there it's about being clear on or is it are we monitoring delivering a certain number of jobs with this asset or are we um is it a certain amount of space that's that's provided for um, affordable uses to socially useful tenants and how do we how do we define the criteria of what that is so you know, there's quite a lot of specificity in terms of um setting up for each individual asset how is it socially useful what does that look like and how are we monitoring and measuring that um so um you know so it, it's quite a an involved process um 
and you know, we were just talking about the, this shift in asset management and it being a big change. It really is quite a significant change because that's not something that I think an asset manager would typically be used to doing. So it is a, a very different approach to the role um, and you know, being able to actually set out like that what social goals you want to achieve with each building and how you're going to monitor and deliver that. Great, thanks very much. Um, and thank you, Gregor, for your question that's just come in. Um, to all speakers, is there a risk of impact washing? Um, so we've had green washing, now impact washing. In the absence of any clear targets on the ambition of intentionality and additionality. Um, so I don't know if anybody wants to pick up that, that point around uh, impact washing replacing green washing. I can start if you want. We have a, a very nice regulation that just uh, came out uh, last week, which is called uh, SFDR, uh, coming from the European Commission, which will definitely, I think, uh, uh, avoid more and more the greenwashing and impact investing, making sure that uh, in, in all financial sectors, all products are kind of set into a specific category with specific requirements. And uh, I strongly believe that it will support uh, the, 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 the decrease of the greenwashing and uh, hopefully no impact washing. OK, great. Does anybody else have a view on that? Um, yeah, if I may, just for a second, uh, I was going to say, yes, there is a real risk. But I think that, uh, the way that we tackle the risk is the intentionality. So if you if you try to retrofit an impact strategy, into a vehicle or into a strategy that it was not intentionally set from the very beginning to deliver positive impact, then I think you have a higher risk of impact washing. If the vehicle was set and has very clear goals, whatever the goals are, then I think the risk is significantly lower. OK, good. Um, quick question for you, Ron, actually, that's come in from, from Martin, which is um, how do you test the degree of social impact created and how much um, beneficiaries sustainably uh, benefited the senior housing investment from different asset classes. Um, I read that dreadfully, Martin. I'm terribly sorry about <laughs> that. <laughs> um, but um, so, Ron, I, I suppose just th that's a question again, a bit about that measurement side, I, I suppose. You know, how, how did you test that in the social housing side? Yeah, well, I think it's the one million dollar question. Um, so on one hand, I think when we have enough uh, enough competitors, uh, we see uh, the the competitive uh, uh, it will it will level. So uh, when we, um, but I think it's I think you you see it on the deal flow maybe, and therefore also coming back to the valuation uh, when, when we see. Uh, emerging markets uh, with high yields and when we see entering new competitors we see a uh, yield compression so I think going back to regular economic uh, cycles um, it always takes time when you have a mature asset class or mature asset market so uh, therefore I also believe when investors now now nowadays are focused on senior living we see more and more pan-european strategies where they try to invest in mature markets, but also explore new markets like uh, the CE, the Nordics, or uh, Italy, for example. Uh, so that's also, I think, one of the benefits of real estate. Uh, there's always an economic uh, market uh, principle where we can fall back on. And that's also, I think, my reaction on the, on the uh, impact uh, washing uh, question. I think when we have enough competitors, uh, clients can choose. And, uh, and I think when we have some regulations, I think the regulations were positive on the uh, environmental side. So when we have the Paris Agreement, uh, you should focus on. So it's really a kick out criteria. And I think this we also need this on the S side. When we have hard criteria, um, you're out of business when you're not performing. So. That's also why I do believe in, and maybe one additional remark, because I think um, uh, the real estate uh, business going to a new era in terms of we see more and more purpose-driven professionals. So I think in maybe five or 10 years, let's be positive. I think real estate is really driven by purpose-driven 
professionals, thought leaders, and organizations. So time will take, uh, uh, I think it, it takes some time, but in the end, we will, uh, we will uh, celebrate uh, uh, ESG and impact investing. Okay, good. And that, um, that kind of brings me around to, I just wanted to pick up, I mean, that sounds to me like that's your kind of key trend that everyone should look out for, Ron, in terms of impact investing. So let, let me just pick up with others as well. Um, Michelle, in, 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 terms of, in terms of your sense, what, what are some of the key trends that you think people should look out for? Well, if, if you look at healthcare, uh, real estate, uh, one, one important trend is, is uh, the aging uh, population, but also uh, a uh, population that uh, is impacted by more diseases and conditions. So I think that that's, that's a key trend. And, um, and another trend is that uh, a changing demand for uh, uh, real assets uh, from the consumer side point of view. So I think that those are the key trends we see in the market now. Great, thanks. Robert. I mean, it's been really interesting to see um, the sort of ongoing discussion around particularly specialist real estate created for dementia and those kinds of things as well. Yeah. Um, uh, Martin, what's your sense of that? What the, the, the kind of key trends? I think the key trends uh, from our study says there would probably be a, a flurry of various different frameworks to measure the S over the next 12 months, and then there'll be a consolidation of these frameworks. I mean, it's, 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 it's the same with um, the same with what happened with accounting standards. I think the same is going to happen or the same happened with environmental standards. And now the, 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 the S from my perspective is the next uh, area where there'll be a, a lot of measurement, it will be slightly sporadic at the very beginning because we're just trying to figure out first and foremost, as Ron pointed out, what exactly are we measuring? Um, and then once we figure out what we're measuring, there'll be a consolidation of framework. So I think there will be, my 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 guess is that in five to 10 years time, to use Ron's for, for kind of frame of reference, you'll see a very clear measurement uh, and management of the S, uh, the same way that we now have the E or we're almost getting there to the, I'm sure Nella is going to correct me there. <laughs> Great. What, what about you, Nella? Uh, well, I, I think we will move uh, gradually, but probably quickly from uh, integrating ESG just to prime offices to all asset classes uh, with a, a, a big uh, focus on alternatives. And by alternatives, I, I think about healthcare, residential, logistics, which are becoming more and more alternatives for traditional uh, investors. And our role and challenge will be to, to, to keep a high level of integration of ESG in these asset classes and at the same time pushing uh, new impact investing strategies on E, S or G, all the three of them. Great. And, uh, and last to you, Abby, and, and actually, uh, Andrew, Andrew, good to see you. Andrew Peterson's just snuck a question in right before the end, which is we know what green is, <clears throat> but how do we measure the transition from brown to green in a meaningful way? So I don't know if you want to just pick that up in your kind of trends. Oh, that's a good question. And actually, one of my, my key trends was really this concept of the green recovery and building back better. You know, we, we're we at, um, hopefully the years ahead will be more positive than the, the last uh, 18 months that we've just had. And you know, economies across the world are going to be focusing on how do we invest positively for the future? How do we bounce back? Um, and I think putting, um, you know, the transition to the low carbon economy at the heart of that is absolutely essential and um, therefore transitioning the existing real estate stock from brown to green by improving its energy efficiency and making large scale retrofits to, to, to real estate globally is, is going to be absolutely critical. And but also, including a focus on socially responsible investment within that as well. So looking at investing in underserved areas, place based investing, investing in, in real estate that's actually meeting social needs. So wrapping both the environmental and the social together uh, into this concept of, uh, of building back better, I think is, uh, is, is, is the trend to, to hopefully see emerging in the years ahead. Great, thanks very much. Um, really interesting panel discussion. Thanks also for thank you to all of the speakers and thank you to you for your uh, for your comments and your questions.